Hello and welcome to another Basics of Marxism class, part of Marxism School, brought to you by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. Tonight is going to be an extremely, extremely um, awesome show. I mean, really, like there's no other way to put it. Um, and sorry, I'm having a bit of t uh, trouble. We're getting Twitch up and running right now. Uh, it, it had a, an issue with calling it the purity fetish, apparently. <laughs> so give me one second. We're handling that. Uh, we are live on Twitch now as well. Welcome to the Basics of Marxism, brought to you by the Midwestern Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. For everyone on YouTube, sorry, uh, it seems like I've been saying that a bunch of times, but we're ready to go now. Uh, tonight, we have a guest teacher, my close friend, my brother, and all-around brilliant man, Carlos Garrido, who wrote uh, what I consider one of the central contributions to American Marxism, the analysis of what we call the purity fetish. Uh, today, we're going to take all of the sort of Marxist building blocks we've learned over the last eight weeks and put them to use in analyzing how the world is today. Uh, editing the book on the purity fetish is maybe one of the most important things I've done in my life. I'm not joking about that. I can't praise this theory enough. Uh, and we're going to get started real quick right after this. <laughs> announcements I want to make before we get into the lecture for tonight. Uh, first and foremost, everyone in the class, if you were planning on writing your paper on where you were with Marxism and where you are now, uh, make sure you get those done because they're not due next week, but the week after that. And uh, speaking of next week, I guess, next week's class is going to be on reproletarianization. Another thing we at the Institute believe is a central part of understanding American Marxism. All that said, though, that's it. Uh, take it away, Carlos. I know everyone's really excited uh, for this class. Hello, everyone. Um, I have also been uh, looking forward to uh, discussing with you on, on the subject of the purity fetish. Um, it's a weird little moment when you're in the Zoom and not uh, in the stream yard because it feels like a, a one minute and 17 seconds uh, moment of silence for the international. But uh, yeah, so uh, the purity fetish, uh, what's interesting about the purity fetish is that um, it's developed uh, in October of 2021 uh, while focusing in on one specific form that I saw the purity fetish taking. And then it's concretized beyond that in the subsequent uh, years, and especially in the book, The Purity Fetish and the Crisis of Western Marxism, in a way that's also very much influenced by the conversations that I've had with Noah, with Eddie, with Tom, and uh, with other folks from the institutes and uh, friends of the institute, scholars that we constantly have on and stuff. Um, and 
the, the, the various other forms that I saw the purity fetish taking were all somehow connected to like the reason why we founded the Midwestern Marx Institute in the first place and like the very immediate, uh, almost like surface level, but I think intuitively correct analysis of what was wrong with the left that in such a moment pregnant with such revolutionary potential, it seemed like nothing substantially was going on. Um, and, you know, there was mobilization after mobilization where millions of people would hit the streets and nothing would come out of it. Uh, they would just go back to work the following week. And, um, you know, the most you could say that came out of it out of something like BLM was like the election of Biden, which what has came out of that, right? Uh, more of the same, uh, in fact, in some areas, a little bit worse than, than what we had uh, before. Um, we're at the precipice of, as you all know, almost uh, a, a World War III catastrophic nuclear annihilational um, moment. And, you know, it, it was seen at least at the time after these massive protests that in terms of numbers, we're the largest we've seen in American history. Some estimates say around 30 million-ish. Um, what came out of it? And it, it was really nothing. And then if we look at really the protests against the war in Iraq, something similar, the um, Occupy Wall Street movement, something similar, the Bernie Sanders progressive uh, movement, something similar. And, um, you know, so that's the environment that Eddie and myself are in as uh, activists and organizers and we're trying to figure out what the hell is going wrong and we come up with a variety of different theses and the those theses ends up then being like uh, retaken up with the analysis of the purity fetish but let me back up a little bit uh, before I, I get to like the various forms that it takes and the connection that this has to how it was that we founded the institute and the purposes behind that. One of the central things that I know you all have been doing in this class is learning the Marxist worldview. And the Marxist worldview at its essence is dialectical materialism. Um, and I think that uh, while, while there's a lot of Marxist scholarship that tries to obscure what that means and what that worldview entails, fundamentally, a lot of its central premises and uh, the ways that it observes the world, some of the central assumptions are already in popular common sense uh, consciousness. And let me just name a few, uh, which are not necessarily unique to Marxism itself, which are present uh, as far back as the philosophy of Heraclitus. Everything is in constant change and motion and transformation. So there's nothing that's static in this world. Everything is in a constant state of motion. And uh, that was a very revolu revolutionary position that was taken by Heraclitus as opposed to other uh, philosophers that were arguing that to take change as a reality is to go down the path of falsity and opinion. Um, that truth is connected to that which is unchanging. And in general, the history of philosophy has treated the question of truth, specifically Western philosophy, has treated the question of truth and of universals in a similar fashion, like what is universal is that which stays the same across space and time. So one of the central postulates is universal change, which is something that we think is observable, uh, very clearly observable in nature, um, in human society and, and in thinking, which are all different forms that nature takes because we're natural beings as well. Um, and that gets at, again, part of the essence of uh, a phrase, which I know that Noah has mentioned a few times from Engels, which is that nature is a test of dialectics, right? We don't have to foist these ideas onto nature by observing nature and being open to the way in which change is constant in it and other principles that I'll get to now. Um, nature itself gets us these, uh, um, this way of viewing the world. Um, there's objective dialectics, like the the way that these principles actually occur in the world. Um, and then there's subjective dialectics, which is us coming to be uh, subjectively aware of these, um, 
of this dialectical character of the world in our minds and thought. So that was the that's one of the first principles that I know you guys have, have covered. Um, another one is universal interconnection. Um, along with the fact that everything is in constant change, everything is also in constant interconnection with everything else. Um, and it's in interconnections, not just in this void, in this sort of empty void, but it exists within totalities, within the given holes in which the interconnections take place and in which the interconnections are both shaping of the whole and the trajectory of the whole and the totality, but reciprocally shaped by the whole itself. And a term that has developed in philosophy for this sort of uh, reciprocal interaction that allows the whole to then influence the parts is emergentism. And there's quite a few examples of that. Uh, uh, one of the ones that uh, uh, Jeeves um, and Brown went out in their book on. Huh? Took a peek at Greg and Hillary's video. She's fine. The baby's Ed, fine. Yeah, it looks like you are uh, unmuted, my friend. Thank you for taking a peek. Uh, the um, so emergentism is a, is a pro, it's a category that leading neuroscientists have have been using, and leading some philosophers of of mine have been using, and it simply describes the way in which certain properties cannot be reduced to parts that exist within a whole um, that when things come into the form of a specific form of totality that totality then reciprocally allows new properties to arise to emerge that are not reducible to the whole um, that are not reducible to to any of its parts or to the aggregate of the parts and a good example of that is ants like um, when ants form in colonies, they're able to think in ways in which individual ants can't. They're able to uh, locate the closest food source to the colony and do all these various sorts of activities that as individual ants, they cannot do. There's a new emergent property that arises from the totality that cannot be pinned down to any specific part within that totality itself. And this has been used to describe thinking and one of the first people that used this to describe the conundrum of thought, how is it that material beings can have such a thing as thought that we can't really point to a specific part in our brain and say, oh, that's thought, um, was Engels. Engels describes thought as this emergent property of highly organized matter, right? Um, and generally, some of the most advanced uh, segments of, of neuroscience and the interactions that neuroscience has had with the philosophy of mind have tended to, to agree on the character of thinking and thought as an emergent property or consciousness as an emergent property of highly organized matter. Um, and that's why you can't reduce it to any particular part of the brain because it emerges from the whole. Um, so I, I got a little bit off the tracks uh, there, but uh, I think it's important to note that. But so you have Universal motion, universal interconnection, that's both are taking place within totalities. And then you have an understanding that things and processes are not homogenous. And by this, I mean, because uh, I know the, the term itself homogenous is, is ambiguous. Um, one definition is like just sameness. Uh, that's not what I mean. But what I mean by homogenous is sort of the other definition, which is uh, not allowing of internal plurality. So containing within itself uniformity, right? Um, and it's important to note that within everything and within every process, within every totality, uh, there is plurality. There's the many. The many exists within the one. Um, and the way that this manifests itself specifically uh, in the dialectical materialist worldview is the understanding and in dialectics in general from Heraclitus to, to Hegel, is the understanding that it is contradiction and the tension that exists between that unity of opposites, that unity, that identity and difference uh, that exists within things and within um, uh, processes that drives that movement. So those are really the, the sort of three central premises of dialectics, universal movement, universal interconnection and contradiction, not as you know, in the way that it meant for a big chunk of philosophy, falsehood, 
right? Where if you arrived at contradiction, if you discovered a contradiction, it was assumed that, oh, you're wrong. Um, you're wrong about something because you got to a contradictory point. In some cases that still holds, but um, you know, you have in general, uh, for instance, the case of uh, Zeno of Elia, who makes the argument that a uh, very famous argument, he makes a few variations of it. Aristotle says that he makes four variations, but he makes the argument that in order to get from point A to point B, you have to go halfway. And to go uh, from point A to that halfway point, you need to go halfway and halfway and halfway and halfway and halfway and halfway. And uh, the argument that he ends up making, it's, it's something called ad infinitum. There has to be an infinite number of halfway points that have to be traversed by a finite being. And that is a contradiction. And so he said, change is an illusion. And this was a form of him defending Parmenides, one of the key thinkers uh, in ancient uh, Greece, defending the view that uh, the world is one, that does not allow for internal plurality, contradiction is falsehood, change is an illusion. But what Hegel notes in this uh, Zeno, what's called Zeno's paradox, and when, in the various forms that they take, is that what he ends up doing is discovering contradiction. And instead of treating this as an amazing breakthrough, in the history of thought, the role that change, that thing which we literally see all the time everywhere, is propelled by contradiction, as an internal contradiction within it. Um, instead of treating that as a discovery, he treated that which he discovered as a sign of the falsity of change, right? So uh, these sort of three principles are in distinction, in contradistinction to some of the central philosophical assumptions held in the history of philosophy. And just to repeat the three, universal change, interconnection, and the role of contradiction. Now, as uh, uh, in the Hegelian and, and then in the, in the Marxist dialectical materialist tradition, that's concretized a little more. Um, we look for certain patterns that change takes. We call those the laws of dialectics. I know that um, Noah has covered these in previous classes, uh, unity and struggle of opposites, negation of the negation, um, quantity to quality. Um, there, it's also a way of rethinking the traditional categories in philosophy. So again, I talked a little bit about the category of emergence. That is itself a way of rethinking the relationship of parts to whole. Um, we rethink the relationship of the individual to society. Uh, we, we rethink the relationship of mind to body. We overcome the the dualism that has been assumed in the history of philosophy of uh, thinking and being. Um, and so it, it's a new way, a radically new way of thinking that is archetypically in its materialist form when it assumes the aspect of matter uh, to be primary. Um, that when something is primary, it doesn't mean that the other side of it can't influence that which is primary. It just means that um, it holds a certain level of primacy uh, in, in the fact that it determines that which then determines it in a reciprocal fashion. Um, so, uh, but the point that I'm trying to get at is that it's a radically new worldview. And when you call yourself a Marxist, what you're, what you're effectively should be saying uh, is that this is the worldview through which you view the world. At the most abstract level, this is like how you approach the world and then that gets concretized in your study of nature, in your study of human society, when you apply it to human society and history, it's historical materialism, and in the history of thought, right? But that's the basic level sort of philosophical assumptions uh, that are both of an ontological character, that means that they make statements about the constitution of how the world actually is, and also of an epistemological character. That means that they make claims about uh, the question of knowledge and how it is that we should best approach the world. And on that latter end, the method that we say is the method of the ascension from the abstract to concrete. We can't know, for instance, um, to use an example that I know was brought up in the class, we can't know the capitalist system systemically and comprehensively until it has developed, until the totality itself has taken shape and matured. Only then can we apply the method of the ascension from the abstract to the concrete and actually have a concrete reproduction in our heads of the concrete. And when I use the word concrete, 
uh, people tend to just want to touch stuff, right? The concrete is the stuff that we touch. The abstract is the stuff that's in our head. Philosophers deal in the realm of abstraction. That's not how the term concrete and abstract is used in Hegel and then in Marx. Both Hegel and Marx have identical quotes. Hegel in the lectures on the history of philosophy and Marx in the Grandrisa, which are a series of manuscripts before uh, he published his Capital in 1867, um, where they say the concrete is a unity of many determinations or diverse determinations. All it means is that the concrete is a unity of many. And what did I say earlier uh, was a sort of synonym for that, the, the whole, the totality. So the most concrete would be the whole. So if I want to study the capitalist system completely uh, or comprehensively concretely, it needs to develop and form into a totality. And I need to use this method of going from the abstract, which will here mean things disconnected from everything else as a sort of starting point to the most concrete. And what you see in Marx's capital, the three volumes is an ascension from the most basic category of the commodity to other commodities, uh, to, to other categories, money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in each case, it gets concretized such that you cannot understand the categories at the end of uh, the theoretical section of the first volume or the categories in the third volume without understanding the previous ones. And you also cannot fully understand the early categories without seeing their unfolding. That means how they concretize, how, they, how something internal within them becomes explicit in the latter ones, right? So it's a, both, uh, it's one and also the other. It's a reciprocal interaction. Um, in order to understand it comprehensively. And I've given the example of like a Bob Ross painting before in videos, which is that if you're not an artist and the sort of person that can just look at a painting and reconstruct in your head how it was that it was painted, Bob Ross in his 30 minutes of paintings, uh, painting really helps you understand how it is that a painting comes about because he goes from the most abstract and empty canvas to the most concrete, which is the whole painting. And he goes piece by piece and you see it in motion you see each brush stroke interconnected to the other brush stroke, and you see all of the, the characteristic principles of the dialectical uh, worldview in action uh, while you're, if you reflect on it, seeing yourself as seeing it as a process from, of going from the abstract to the country. So this is at its core um, dialectical uh, materialism. And what ends up happening, and the reason why the category of the purity fetish ends up being developed, is that I looked at how it was that the Western Marxists have looked at socialist states. That was the first example. Um, and how were they treating it? How, how do they treat socialist states? Well, they have this definition, this pure definition, this pure idea of what socialism is. And then they measure that pure idea up against uh, the socialism, the socialist states and the class struggles that end up conquering political power in the real in the real world, whether it's the USSR, China, Korea, uh, Vietnam, Cuba, whatever the case might be. And then they say, well, the reality doesn't measure up to my pure idea. And because it doesn't measure up, it cannot actually be socialism, right? They are unable in, in doing so, what they're unable to do is think through socialism as a process. That is, see how it is that uh, socialism is not the static thing, but something that's in constant motion. The one time that Marx and Engels explicitly say communism is, they say communism is the real movement of history, which abolishes the present state of things. So um, it's they're unable to do that, see things in their motion. They're unable to see socialism as or so these socialist states in their interconnection. So they can't place it in the global capitalist imperialist system in which it existed and which affects it because it is, inter, it is interconnected uh, to it. They're unable to see the natural role of contradictions. Um, you know, they'll, they'll observe certain contradictions within socialist states and see that things are not perfect or ideal. Uh, and uh, because of that, they're going to reject it without failing to reflect on the fact that if they actually believe um, or investigate concretely what they're looking at, they have to see that contradictions are universal. They exist everywhere, in nature and in society and in, uh, and in thought. 
And uh, that doesn't mean that socialism has been disproven because there's contradictions. Uh, it's absurd. We, we should avoid antagonistic contradictions, which is a category that is developed further by Mao. Contradictions will always uh, appear in, in every social system because they appear everywhere. Um, and it's, again, a result of the fact that we're talking about uh, a, a many that exists within the one and that propels the movement of that one, of that totality. And so they're unable to, for instance, uh, think about the ways in which uh, the concept in, in German Aufhebung, uh, in English is usually translated to tabulation um, or supersession sometimes. The way that that implies that socialism in its earliest stages or in its transitional stages, um, in its earliest transitional forms, is going to have to always contain elements of the previous order. Marx talks about this as like the birthmarks of, of the previous orders. There's a million different ways. Lenin even calls it like a hybrid of like the proletariat and, and, and socialism with political power and then uh, hybrid because there's like state capitalism or state uh, socialism and uh, there's a capitalist enterprise. And so they're unable to see how socialism is going to necessarily have a little bit of the old social order, just like capitalism has a little bit of the old social order and contains it within it because the way that things change is not by fully breaking with that which was previous to it, but by preserving a part of it and canceling another part. This is what tabulation uh, means. Um, you cancel a part of it and you preserve and elevate into the new thing, another part of the rational kernel uh, in the old. So. The Western Marxists have never been able to see this in socialism and at, at its root has been a fundamentally anti-dialectical way of examining socialist countries. And the, that's sort of the negative formulation. They lack dialectics. As that famous phrase uh, from the 1890s, I think 1892 letter to Conrad Schmidt, where Engels says, what all these men lack is dialectics. The way that I formulate the positive form of that, like the form of thinking, that uh, can be positively defined in the form of the absence of dialectics, what's the purity fetish? Why do they do that? Well, because they cannot think through contradictions. They cannot think through change. Um, they cannot think through interconnection. And they, do, they, they fail in all of these fears precisely because they treat the things that they approach through a form that says, here's the pure idea almost like a platonic ideal. And if reality doesn't measure up to that, I'm going to reject it. And that is the purity fetish, an incessant obsession with purity such that judgment in the real world, in the real world is determined by whether or not the thing you're looking at achieves that purity. If it does, then you can support it. If it doesn't, then you can't. But what ends up happening is that you just can't be neutral in a moving train, as Howard Zinn used to say. So in doing that, they end up becoming what I call in the book, agents of a controlled counter hegemony. They end up becoming the fake left or in Gabriel Rocco's terms, the radical recuperators and Lou Cox's terms, the sort of people that propel an indirect apologetics of, of the system. Um, there's a, a variety of different ways that you can call it, but essentially they're just a compatible left. They don't substantially threaten capitalism because they consider the alternatives capitalist imperialism is actively fighting against, but not actually be an alternative. And it, in many instances, they consider it to be far worse. So they end up in this sort of Thatcherite position where they accept there is no alternative. Um, we're in this uh, Winston Churchill style position where they, they say capitalism is the worst system except for all the other ones. Um, and, you know, they end up treating capital, the dominant order, objectively, like uh, Leibniz uh, would treat God, where, you know, the question comes up, well, how can there be God and evil at the same time and all these different things if God is all-knowing, all-powerful, uh, and all-loving? And the answer is like, yeah, yeah, but this is the best of all possible worlds. If you think this world is bad, the other ones are worse. And that's what the Western Marxists end up doing with, with capitalism, right? If they think socialism is far worse, and a lot of them equate it with fascism and Nazism, um, then, then capitalism is the best of all possible alternatives. Um, and uh, so that's one of the paradoxes within the purity fetish that, uh, you know, there's 
always gaps and uh, within that sort of logic of I'm only going to pass judgment on the basis of whether a thing measures up to its purity or not. And objectively, they side with imperialism. They wouldn't say this explicitly, but objectively they do. The function that they play is precisely that. It's one of recuperating the people, which in times of crisis, they're like, my life is hard. How do I change this? Um, and if they had a strong communist party, they had they would have the answers to why it is hard and how to change it. But instead, they have these sorts of clowns that are propped up by the Western Academy and by the uh, NGOs and by the media, um, and that have this whole elaborate political economy of knowledge that funds them with millions and billions of dollars, journals, publications, magazines, teaching positions, all sorts of stuff in order for those people to be the official counter hegemony. And they want it like that because they know that they're controlling it. They don't substantially oppose capitalist imperialism. And there's material reasons for this, the funding, the class position in the petty bourgeoisie um, and in the uh, intelligentsia. And um, at, the ideological, at the ideological level, what the purity fetish does is allow us to see what is their outlook? What do all these different people who take different forms in the way that they mess up and end up siding with imperialism at the end of the day, how are they themselves interconnected to each other? And the way that all these different mistakes that we see in the Western Marxists or in American Marxists, et cetera, the way that they're all interconnected or in Trotskyites is through the purity fetish, through again, this incessant approach to the world that if things do not measure up to their ideal, perfect, pure idea, they're going to reject it. They fetishize the pure idea and leave the world and its meanness and its contradictory character and its procedural nature and its interconnectedness. They leave all of that behind in favor of this pure static idea that allows of no internal contradiction, no interconnection and, and, and no uh, movement. So um, that takes two additional forms, I argue in the book in, uh, in American Marxists, one of which is the rejection of their national past, um, which, is, is really what uh, Georgi Dimitrov called in 1935 national nihilism. They look back at their past. They see it as impure because it is impure. Uh, they reject it completely, right? That's the nihilism part. They're saying no to their national past. And what ends up happening when they do that is that they end up participating in a form of uh, liberal American exceptionalism. Everywhere else in the world, uh, socialism has been the content which has taken a specific national form. You remove the jargon, all that really means is that socialism is going to take root in a way that resembles the traditions, the history, and the culture of the people in which it is taking root in, the people that won the struggle for political power and that are now constructing socialism. And this comes from a very basic dialectical law um, or really dialectical understanding of the categorical interaction between universal and particular. Whereas old school Western philosophy saw the universal here, the particular here, were divided um, by an unbridgeable gap, uh, gulf. Dialectical uh, philosophy, dialectical thinking says that no, there could be no universal divorced from the particular. What makes something universal is its ability to take different forms, uh, different particular forms over time. And so, we juxtapose to that abstract universal, rootless universal philosophy, a rooted and concrete universal. Um, when you apply this to socialism, again, it means that it always has to take a particular form, a particular concrete form. And the American Marxists that have this form of national nihilism, the rejection of the past, they're unable to see that. And so they end up in a position where, yeah, 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 socialism in Russia can take Russian forms in China, Chinese characteristics in Cuba, Cuban characteristics in Venezuela, Bolivarian socialism in Africa, Pan-African socialism. But we, the virtuous Americans, we have the capacity to just say no to all of our traditions and reduce our country's history to slavery, settler colonialism, imperialism, exploitation, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that is fundamentally incorrect. Right, It's a one-sided view of American history. We have in the underbelly of that horrible, evil history, a history of struggles, a history of people's struggles against racism, against sexism, uh, for socialism, against imperialism, for peace, uh, the history of the labor movement. It's, it's such a rich 
history of struggle, which you would understand has to necessarily exist wherever there's oppression, wherever there's exploitation, there's going to be struggles. Um, so one of the things, and here um, I want to mention this, the purity fetish uh, not only, I, I'll give the third form and then I'll make this point. So that's the second form that the purity fetish takes in the US. The third form is the way that they have been approaching, especially since the Trump phenomenon and the development of you know, what some people have called Trump derangement syndrome, the part of the working class that decided to vote for Trump, um, oftentimes as someone who's organized in the Midwest, because of the fact that they saw him as uh, someone who was gonna drain the swamp. Now we know that's not true, um, We've experienced in the in the four years that he was president the fact that that wasn't true, um, but the instinct was still radical. I want something new. I'm tired of the established order, and it is only the communists who can actually give them uh, the world in which they would be dignified in living it. Not Trump, not the Democrats, not any of the bourgeois parties. Uh, however. In the face of this contradiction and it's in a, and their inability to see these contradictions, a big chunk of the left just reduced this group of people to being fascist, racist, unorganizable, an unorganizable um, basket of deplorables. And the Hillary Clinton's uh, horrible phrase. Um, so what happens there? How is the purity fetish connected to that? Well, they have this pure idea of the sort of enlightened social ideals that the working class must have in order to be organized. And if they don't measure up to that, you know, if they don't have the most advanced position on trans issues or something, or on whatever issue, um, on issues of foreign policy, whatever the, the case might be, if they don't have the most advanced positions, then you cannot organize them. And that effectively means that as a JV, I don't know if he's here today, I don't think he's here, but JV gave me uh, this, analogy, which I use in the book, it means that communists are reduced to preaching to the choir. We're reduced to the sorts of people that can only ever talk to the people that already agree with us, right? Um, because if we say to people that have imperfect views, we're not going to organize you, and you're beyond our, our reach of what's organizable, who are we talking to? Just the small insular spaces that we are already in. We can win socialism like that. The task of communists is to be able to go to the working classes, not because they're already socialists or because they're Democrats or because they're Republicans. You go to the working class because of their class position, their material objective position in society makes them revolutionary. And wherever they are ideologically, you figure out the ways to get what is rational in their outlook and reorient it, rearticulate it to socialism, dislocate it from the current outlook that they have and uh, relocate it in a socialist class conscious uh, um, outlook. You can't do that if you're rejecting the Trump part of the working class because they're too impure. So in every instance, in every form that the purity fetish takes in the U.S. and in the West in general, you find not only the inability to actually understand the world and to grasp proof, right? So it's, a, I, in my view, at least a deeply anti-philosophical way of looking at the world because philosophy is embedded in the conquest and the, the, the striving for truth. They can't grasp truth. They can't understand things correctly, precisely because they're not dialectical. They can't see things concretely. They miss everything that I already mentioned of what dialectics was and why it's a better way of looking at the world that allows you to understand it better. They're not only not able to understand the world, they're completely unable to have a revolution and to organize for socialism. And it's not a coincidence that these people who spend all their time condemning socialism, who uh, within the five, the first five to 10 pages of their books, they're criticizing Stalinism and China and this and that and all socialist experiments, calling them not real socialism. It's not a coincidence, it's these people haven't done anything. What revolution have they produced? From what moral high ground are they speaking from? They haven't produced anything. And these things are not disconnected. What the purity fetish allows us to do is see them in their interconnection see the different forms that they take and how in every instance, they're not only unable to grasp truth, but also unable to build a revolutionary movement. If you reject your national past in the US, you're not gonna be able to find in the common sense of the American people, the rational kernels that you can use to 
dislocate the outlook that they have and relocate those rational kernels to socialism. That means that means you can't convince people. You cannot win the war of positions, as Gramsci you know, would call it, the war of hegemony, the war of ideas, whatever you want to call it. You cannot win if you're already disconnecting yourself from the common sense of the American people, which is embedded in their history, right? That's one example. If you accept all the anti-communist bullshit that the ruling class and its uh, McCarthy agents have fed the American people about communism, and if you go up to them and say, yeah, we're going to fight for communism, but, you know, the Soviet Union and China and all these countries, they were so horrible and they, there was genocide and there was famine and it was poverty and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera dictatorship, totalitarian. If that's your approach, the working class person you're talking to has to be a complete idiot to say, you know what, I trust you. I trust you. I'm going to go with you. Because the, when you do that, the approach, what you're saying effectively is all of these people in the global south and east that have tried socialism, they all failed. But we, the virtuous West or the virtuous Americans, we're the ones that are going to get it right. And no one buys into that. It's much more effective as an organizing strategy to show how they have been lied to, why the people that lied to them have an interest in keeping them ignorant about the gains of socialism, and then what the gains of socialism, even under the boot of imperialist hybrid warfare in every instance, from you know from the first experiment, uh, Russia gets invaded after its revolution by 17 countries, the US, the UK, Japan, France included. From the start, they attack us with everything they got. And we've still been able to develop so much and lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, give them dignified lives in every socialist experiment up to date. Every single socialist experiment has done that. If we take that message to the working class in our country, we will be much more effective at convincing them to fight for socialism than if we accept the lies of empire because we have the purity fetish outlook. And the last point, if we don't organize the big chunk of the working class that has imperfect views, I mean, that's kind of self-evident. Like, who the hell are you gonna organize? Who are you gonna bring to your side? If a big chunk of the population, you're in an a priori fashion before even engaging with them saying they're unorganizable. So this is the analysis of, of the, the purity fetish. It's grounded really on uh, many people who have had similar insights um, and I'm, I'm trying to sy systematize it and I, I've tried to systematize it in as best a form as I can. There's various similar concepts that have arisen and of course quotes that appear in the classics that point to an understanding of this and a critique of the purity fetish. And what I try to do is sort of connect all of that in a way that helps us understand the world today, why it is that the left is failing in such a revolutionarily pregnant moment and how it is that we can move forward. And I think that entails doing the sort of stuff that we're doing now, educating people on the dialectical materialist outlook and preparing so that within a few years, um, you know, we can be effective, more effective in organizing and, and be able to seize the objective revolutionary conditions of our moment. Um, it's wrong to assume that just because things get hard, revolution is guaranteed. That's a fatalistic understanding and that has no role in Marxism. Freedom and necessity or freedom and determinism are in a dialectical relationship to the other. Things can get as bad as they want. Our moment could be as pregnant with revolution as it wants. But if like people to the don't do things can get as bad as they want. Our moment, but if people don't do what's required of them in the moment, if they don't freely take up uh, the task of being the agents of history uh, and, and, and functioning in this form that Hegel called the cunning of, re of, of reason, where your individual will lines up with the will of history. If we don't do that as individuals, no revolution is going to come about. Or in the words of Lenin, um, no order, regardless of how much it wobbles, will topple on its own. It's up to us to do it. And I think the purity fetish is a way that we can understand why we failed and how we can move forward. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that, brother. I think that was a brilliant encapsulation of the theory of the uh, purity fetish. While you were going, uh, we had a couple questions pop up and a couple uh, uh, super chats and super stickers. So if you'd like to answer a couple questions for us, that would be awesome. Uh, first, 
Thank you to Ill State Fishing, who says, amazing work, comrades. Thanks for the 10 bucks. Uh, without that kind of thing, honestly, this institute has no funding whatsoever. So while we're on the subject, um, like, subscribe, hit the little bell. I hate doing this, but we really do get suppressed algorithmically, and it really makes a difference. Go to patreon.com slash midwesternmarks or our buy me a coffee if you want to help us out financially. Uh, there's one more here from Lemonheads who says, are you ever discouraged by the fall of the USSR? Do you want to take that, Carlos? Um, I am not because I, I'd be discouraged if the contradictions that led it to fall um, wouldn't have manifested themselves and we wouldn't have learned from it. But we've learned from it uh, and more specific, the people have learned from it best and that I've studied very carefully have been the Chinese communists who don't want to end up having the same route as the Soviet Union. And um, the general schema of how they saw the fall develop um, and at least in terms of its internal contradictions, uh, Jay, can connected you please to mute your mic? internal influences uh, and, and hybrid warfare. Uh, but in terms of its internal contradictions, there's been ideological, political, and organizational um, flaws that led to that. Ideological, national, and historical nihilism, the phenomenon we're criticizing here with the purity fetish. They rejected Stalin, de-Stalinization. And uh, not that Stalin was perfect or that there weren't parts of Stalin that could have been criticized, but you don't do that in the ways that they did it, which was just complete erasure of, of, of Stalin and you know a brutal process and left the people confused and no good. Uh, connected to that is organizational flaws, which is the fact that you know the same agents that uh, overtook the process of de-Stalinization um, were allowing just anyone to come into the party. And the party became, instead of being the vanguard of the working class, the most developed segment of our class, um, it became just a place where careerists can go and advance uh, their personal interests uh, and not have to be rooted in the actual struggle for uh, socialism. So there was organizational flaws and then there were political flaws. You know, the party had a structure that was adopted in a very desperate period. Um, uh, and it had to necessarily be a little bit more top down than it could have been in other epochs. And that top down character made it so that at the end of its life, when the Gor uh, when Gorbachev gets in and uh, the real deeply reformist um, and uh, frankly bourgeois and, and, and traitor elements of the party come into power, there weren't the democratic mechanisms to really take them out. And this is the analysis of the Chinese, ideological, organizational, and political. And the fact that that analysis exists uh, means that we've learned. And uh, if we're the sort of species that doesn't trip over the same rock twice, we've prevented that sort of thing from happening. Now the question is what other forms can they appear through, what other contradictions can arise in, in, in the struggles that will lead um, the advancements made to be recalled. You know, that's for, for history to see. Hopefully um, we're able to maneuver our way out of those. But um, I don't think that uh, that the fall of the Soviet Union discourages me. And, you know, maybe it's just because I wasn't even alive to see it. I know that it's discouraged a lot of genuine good comrades that I uh, interact with on a uh, uh, on a constant basis. But it shouldn't discourage us at all today, especially with the rise of China collapse of the empire, de-dollarization supposed to be, you know, fully in process by 2030, we'll have only 30% of the global trade be in the dollar. And that's assuming that it continues going down at the pace it's going and not that it speeds up and it's, you know, all indicators uh, point towards it speeding up. So I am very optimistic about our moment if we're able to get our shit together. Yeah, I'm absolutely always optimistic, and I have been since the 21st century began. I was very pessimistic for a very long time, um, but reproletarianization sort of changes things. And, you know, and we'll learn about that next week. Don't worry, everybody. But 
what really uh, keeps me optimistic is knowing the general laws of development that Marxism gives to us, right? That we're learning here in this class. Um, and honestly, it's just always a mixture of that and the inspiration I get from you guys. Everyone in this class, everyone watching this video, from Carlos himself, the, this type of theory doesn't just arrive from nowhere. It arrives from the immediacy and necessity of now. American Marxism couldn't have developed back in the day. The conditions weren't right for it, right? We couldn't have understood Du Bois as this brilliant thinker that he is. We couldn't have called him the father of American Marxism back then. We can only recognize these things now after all of this development is happening. We can only understand the middle classes after they've developed and begin repolitarianizing. Uh, so yeah, optimism all the way. The, the revolution is up to us. It's up to us to seize and take. We got a couple and more. The, just a, a real quick point. Uh, it's connected to a tweet we put out a few days ago. Um, the ruling classes are not pessimists in relationship to our potential. Like the ruling classes are sometimes even more optimistic than we are. That's why they spend so many resources and, and so much money trying to put us down and trying to confuse us with, with bunk theory. Um, it's because they know that if we are clear about the issues in our everyday life and their systematic character, we would know how to move forward and that we have the potential to genuinely transform society. That's why they confuse us and spend so much money doing so. That's why they try to overthrow socialism. And, you know, it's, they know our power. And uh, when we buy into that pessimism, uh, we're doing what they want us to do, which is think that we can't do anything. If we if we continue to think that we can't do anything, we won't do anything because it takes agency to transform society. So uh, reject that pessimism. Be at least as optimistic as the bourgeoisie, which spends its uh, its 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 money on trying to confuse you. Billions in different organizations and institutions spent on lying to us, on telling us in a million different ways. Don't do anything. They would not do that, like Carlos says, if there weren't something we could do. Uh, Daniel Jacobs here has a great question for you, though, Carlos. He says, how does the purity fetish differ from just standard sectarianism? Um, I would say that there is, uh, in many forms of sectarianism, a purity fetish at play. And I think a lot of these things are, are interconnected to the critique that have been made in the past um, between different, uh, I don't know if I'd call it forms of Marxism because I think that there's a correct form, but with, within different uh, forms that people that have called themselves Marxists have used to interact with each other. Um, and I mean, there's there's quotes in, in, uh, in Lenin where he's talking about um, the foolishness of the left comms and uh, them thinking uh, in a, what I guess Daniel would imply as a sectarian fashion, that we can't bring like bourgeois specialists on board. And he's like, you know, I I take one bourgeois specialist uh, that can help us develop in this very important moment after the revolution over 15 of these people that are, you know, rooted in petty bourgeois uh, positions and in petty bourgeois consciousness. And that, that expresses itself through these um, uh, very pompous phrases and the sloganeering of just like memorizing conclusions and slogans. And if reality doesn't measure up to that, they reject it. So um, sectarianism is usually deeply rooted in the purity fetish. Um, so there is the, Daniel is right to see uh, a connection there. Yeah, give me, I mean, one on the edge of class consciousness, sort of random working class person who just wants to do what's right by their community and their family, over a thousand of these people that, you know, put a hammer and sickle in their Twitter profile and run around telling everybody else how bad they are. You know, one, not even technicians and specialists, just one person who wants to do the right thing, <laughs> you know? 
right yeah. right and um that's not to say that people can't change mm. you know we mm -hmm. if we understand that we ourselves have changed and i know i've, I've changed a lot i mean i had a short-lived anarchist face in undergrad i mean there's no, something I, mean, I did too it was bad <laughs> right i think most of us did eddie skipped it eddie went from uh, social democrat to, to to Marxist, um, we were able to prevent his anarchist phase, uh, but uh, thanks to Parenti. But um, you know, if we realize that we have changed, and if we reflect on our lives and realize that uh, our process of getting to our ideological positions that allow us to have a certain level of clarity has been a process, we have to be open to the potential in others to change as well. So. Um, when I critique the purity fetish, I'm not condemning the people that have it and saying, you know, we have to reject all of these people and never talk to them again. No, I'm almost stretching my hand to say, let's try to overcome that together. You know, you're you're capable of changing and of, you know, removing that uh, form of looking at the world in the way that all of us have been able to. Um, yeah. So it's. Sometimes I get harsh or we get harsh with the terms we use against these people because of the intensity of, of the moment. But um, I think if we're able to always reflect on and, and put the best, when we are able to put the best version of our thought forth, that is a version that um, is open to all of these folks that we're criticizing changing and that doesn't condemn them because it realizes the potential that they have for changing. 1000% and to say all that a little easier, we can't have a purity fetish against people who are embodying the purity fetish, right? We're here to get things done for real. It doesn't matter what wrong ideas they had in the past. As long as they're into moving forward, we can work with it, you know? Uh, we got one more question I saved here. This one uh, seems like it may have been a little um, malintentioned, but I think it's a good question regardless. Uh, InGen says, I would really like to hear what this guy has to say on the national question, as Lenin put it, in relation to Native Americans. Um, I want to I take a stab at it first, but then I'll give it over to you, Carlos. Um, national liberation is a form of class struggle, right? It's not divorced from it. And the interests of working class Native Americans are the same as the interests of all the rest of working class people, right? Internationalism, especially as Lenin put it, is the material interests of different nations coinciding based on this class struggle, right? And in the national question, Lenin and then Stalin, they both sort of make contributions saying that national liberation as class struggle is not always progressive, right? Well, as class struggle it is, but every struggle of every nation isn't always progressive. But in the case of Native Americans, how could it not be? Um, but yeah, go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. I don't think that's ever even, it's, it's never been that central of a question because everyone in the tradition of Marxism-Leninism and the Third International has understood that national self-determination is key. Um, and uh, if in our country, uh, you know, the First Nations, uh, indigenous people, if they want national self-determination, then of course, like there has to be uh, programs for uh, land reform and, and, and that could be settled when the time comes. My only fear is, and, uh, you know, I might be right, I might be wrong, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, but my only fear is that usually when I see this discourse, it's coming from middle class white folks that have a very romanticized picture of indigenous people and fail to realize that a good portion of the indigenous community has been proletarianized and has been to some degree Americanized. And that uh, what we've seen in our history through the second revolution, the what's called the Civil War, um, and through the Civil Rights Movement, which produced the Third American Revolution, a political revolution. What we've seen is in our history has been the sort of development of a people um, uh, and uh, or of a nation that, of course, as one and contains within it uh, a lot of plurality, um, 
But I, I think we've seen a problem. This is part of the a very essential component of Noah's theory of reproletarianization. We've had such a development of a united people and um, the conditions that indigenous working class people have look a hell of a lot more like the conditions of poor and working class white people and poor and working class black people and poor and working class Hispanic Americans and Asian Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, than they do for whatever portion of the indigenous community is, is bourgeois. So that's been a process of, of becoming a people. And um, I, I find that, again, you know, you have many people that treat the indigenous community um, as if the last 300 years haven't happened, as if objective conditions haven't developed and transformed things. We can't turn the clock backwards. Um, that kind of by definition would be reactionary. Um, we've moved forward and we have to find a way to move forward that accounts for indigenous self-determination. And if indigenous people themselves just want to be a, a part of this American process, that's also open to that. Um, and that removes any sense of um, exceptionalism or white supremacy that uh, has been allowed to seep into the idea of what Americans are um, because it's been absolutely necessary in dividing <laughs> the working class. And I would just want to reiterate a phrase that Carlos Martinez, I think one of the best Anglophone Marxist historians of our time and a good friend of the Institute, uh, he says, which is, it comes from, it's a development of a Fred Hampton quote, I believe, Malcolm X, I think, um, which is that, you know, you can't have capitalism without racism and you can't have socialism with it. Um, and the issue of indigenous people and indigenous uh, liberation and the indigenous struggle against colonialism is deeply embedded in the struggle against racism because it's they've been dehumanized in ways that are similar to, to um, the African people that were brought here and enslaved. Uh, so uh, we can't have any of that in socialism. And I don't think uh, even for people that have different views on how to treat the question, I don't think that's a question that's even on the table. Like we have to get rid of all of these poisonous forms of thinking that split people away from each other. Well, I think right at the end there, you hit on like a very, very deep point. Not as, not, not to say the rest of it wasn't deep, but the fact is we can't have socialism with all that stuff. Not that we shouldn't, but that it's physically impossible for the American people to move forward into socialism while splitting each other up like this into repressed segments and unrepressed segments. It just doesn't work. And so one other thing I wanted to say to add on to what Carlos is saying, uh, a friend of mine, a black communist said to me that one of the worst things he's ever said, and this was actually during a, a time when he was sort of very into black nationalism, was that, um, you know, a white guy running around telling him he's not American, especially a rich white guy running around telling him he's not American, is a lot different than his community being materially not American, right? So be very careful. You don't want to be a sort of woke segregationist, right? Uh, and like you said, a lot of this comes from rich suburban white people. Um Lemonheads here has a, a, another super sticker. So thank you so much, Lemonheads. I'm going to let Carlos field this one because I really just like listening to him talk. He says we have we have a couple questions in the Zoom. Right? We oh, want to address right. those. Yeah, let's get to those. Let's and JB we'll get questions. right to those. Uh, I was I had a plan. That's okay. Lemonhead says, "Why do we expect Israel to turn back the clock, though?" What? It, uh, Lemonhead sent a super sticker saying, why do we expect Israel to turn back the clock, though? Because if the conditions haven't changed qualitatively yet. Right, it hasn't been a process. couple hundred years the, of development. As the a settler, right, the settler colonialist process in Israel is still ongoing. Um, whereas in, in our country, at least from the closing of the frontier in the 1890s, it's been it's been transformed into a new stage in capitalism. Uh, so it's, you know, it's right to compare Israel to like 
perhaps the early stages of American capitalism when it was still in what you know some people would call a settler colonialist uh, a, a phase. But um, you know, to compare it to the U.S. today is it'd be like comparing mercantile capitalism in one part of the world to to the U.S. because there was a period at the beginning of the country where it had it, like or or to Britain or something like that, like. Capitalism has had various stages. Parts of older stages are contained in uh, later ones, uh, but they're not the dominant one. And their existence is mediated by the dominant stage. And a dominant stage in the US today is imperialism. It's a stage of monopoly capital. Um, so we can expect Israel to turn back the clock because the clock is still there. It's still the same clock that we're uh, working with. It's still a, a settler, colonial, genocidal, apartheid uh, state. Uh, the U.S., especially after the um, the uh, uh, Third Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement, has kind of undone a lot of that. So there's still birthmarks of it, still systemic racism and, and prejudice thinking parts of the population. But legally, um, the struggle for recognition was won. And now we've realized that recognition, political judicial recognition is not enough, that we need to change the civil society and the relations of production, which made it necessary to have that struggle for recognition for Black people, for immigrants, for natives in the first place. This is actually all part of the theory of reproletarianization, right? That it wasn't possible to really win a struggle for socialism when we were forcibly separated by bourgeois law. And that's a big important thing. And I think a lot of times the, the people who mean well but end up in these ultra left positions, they end up really minimizing the hugeness of the civil rights revolution and what that changes and the social relations that changes and what that what sort of conclusions that forces us to begin looking at. And uh, you are absolutely right, Carlos, that we have some questions. So I'm sorry I was ignoring your class. Uh, well, not ignoring you, but anyway, why don't you go ahead, Cheryl? Yeah, um, one of the points that you had brought up was how you can't just have pure socialism. You have to can you have to remember your past and incorporate it in, in where you're going. And sort of a related idea along those lines. I've noticed that uh, people, leftists who live around a lot of conservatives and and just be, because of their circumstances have to, have to talk to them a lot, they seem to come up with some of the most, um, darn, I just forgot the word, insightful, <laughs> insightful ideas about to, to describe to, to describe the leftist thinking. And they are the ones most likely to be really sincere about it as opposed to uh, the shit libs who just are parroting what everybody else says around them because that's the popular thing to say. Yeah, they, I, I mean, it's sort of like an echo chamber since they don't see out, they don't realize people outside of that echo chamber are good people. Right. Yeah. Uh, so and, and when, when you when you other. talk when you when you talk to people who are, are conservative, you realize that they do they are good people and they do have some good points, and so it refines your ideas a lot better. 100%. And you find out that they 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 can they will actually listen to some some points that you make. In my experience, the one determining difference is not. Um, you know, whether they're liberal or conservative, but whether they're working class or re proletarian or one of the remnants of the middle class. So whether they're liberal or conservative, it's it's class. It's almost always class. Uh, but thank yeah. you so much for that, Cheryl. That was really, really, really well said. Uh, why don't you go yes. ahead? I, 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 I think it's uh, just to, to give a comment here. Um, it's not new. Uh, we've had, uh, it's rooted in a certain form of cosmopolitanism and a certain form of elitism that comes from the 
uh, borders of, of the country, uh, uh, the eastern border, the New York types and uh, California types on the other side. Some of it might still exist in, in Chicago. Um, but it's, it's always been a sort of looking down upon um, uh, working people of different sorts, whether urban, the urban proletariat or the rural proletariat and the farmers. It's always rooted in a sort of middle class and cosmopolitan pompousness um, that has all these preconceived assumptions of what people are like. And um, that was one of the first things I got rid of when I got to the Midwest. I uh, grew up in Miami. You have all these ideas of what the Midwest Rust Belt is, especially after you know Trump being elected. Oh, these are all racist. And I mean, I had baseball coaches. I got I went to a university first to play baseball and I fell in love with philosophy etc but I had baseball coaches warning me like hey you know it's uh, Iowa is not South Florida like I grew up basically just with uh, Hispanics and black people I had maybe met five white folks in my life by the time I was uh, like 18 so they, they told me hey you know uh, the Midwest is not uh, Florida um, and all this sort of stuff warning me about it and then I get to the Midwest and they're like super nice people um it was it was a different almost more hospital um relationality that i found and that sort of debunked a lot of I, I saw workplaces that were diversified people friends with each other and it was like this whole image that exists at least in the communities i've been at it's it's not true it's just not true and it has uh shaped our perception of this part of the country where there's still working class people who are exploited and oppressed who have their own contradictions sure but um who we can reach and uh who are fairly ripe uh to be reached i would say you know and it's it's easier to reach a whole lot of them who've had their jobs um exported uh, so that capital can have uh, more surplus value super exploiting workers abroad it's easier to, to reach them than to reach some of the middle class types in the borders of the countries who still have fairly decent living standards and who have all these fake assumptions about poor working class people of all creeds in the Midwest and in other parts of the country. Um, so, yeah, a lot of that I think is uh, how easily they trust the institutions of the ruling class, right? And a lot of this comes from the media because one, it's not like racism is gone right there are still racists believe me there are um the the i the, the 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 narrative though is and i was actually talking about this earlier um the illusion of examples right so they will show like something like like you know confederate flags flying up and down the street this is the exception that to the rule which is usually that's not the case right but because it is that exception people film that and they're like what but then the media gets a hold of this and they create this whole narrative that this is how people in the south are this is how people in the midwest are etc 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 and really the truth is if we look at american history right the whole trajectory is overcoming that in the most advanced sections of our working class leading the way in overcoming that over a few hundred years now right so today there are less racists in this country than ever before in its history and that's a big deal and that's a big accomplishment and so when the when the bourgeois media sort of portrays this it gives all these like middle class liberals who you know, are a bit comfortable, don't experience um, interaction with other races a lot of the time, they can easily come to this conclusion that, oh, yeah, maybe they're right. Um, but I, I mean, that was really just an addendum to the far more interesting thing Carlos said. Uh, JB, though, you have something to add. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, just um, after hearing your explanation about uh, the country as far as race is concerned, um, that's 
that's true in some cases, whereas the the systems still are racist in, in themselves. Really? And so, so the thing is, is that while there's a lot of people, especially a lot of white people who are are not necessarily racist, the thing is, is that what a lot of people are, especially a lot of black people within my community, we're now fo focused on it's not enough no longer to be not racist, but now to be anti-racist. And the thing is, is that, but that also is what I recognize as a tool by the bourgeois, by the ruling class to keep us divided. And so one of the best ways is to realize that we're all workers and that white people are just as manipulated and they're just as oppressed. The only thing is that they are being used as tools to keep us divided by believing that, oh, these different, uh, uh, these different stereotypes about black people and what have you. And so that's why coming together as workers and realizing that we all have this, this struggle together, that's what also what, 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 what is what will help us. Because I think it was somebody was talking about dialectics in, uh, on TikTok and they basically said that once we start to realize that um, all black people are basically just, uh, you know, a different set of second class citizens, then they will start to realize, oh, wait, we need to all come together. And these preconceived notions that I have about black people, or it could be trans people, or it could be immigrants, that this is just a means to keep us divided so that we can, we'll stay poor. Um, and then another uh, point that I wanted to bring out was about what Carlos was talking about, the purity, <coughs> excuse me, purity fetish, <coughs> excuse me, regarding uh, looking at other countries and how they are doing socialism. It's like trying to clean a house. Some people expect oh, we will not have a truly clean house until the house is completely spick and span. When in reality, the process of cleaning the house is making the house cleaner. So you can say, oh, well, you know, um, you got the clothes up and you clean the baseboards, but there's still things around so the house isn't fully clean, so it's not clean at all. And it's like, but yeah, it's cleaner, therefore, what the Chinese doing are the People's Republic of China, uh, what people have done in Cuba, Vietnam, they may have, you know, still some subsets of, so of capitalism that they need to get rid of, but they have gotten rid of a lot of it so far, meaning that they're working towards it, which means it is a process. So, you know, they haven't reached the, in, it's like, I haven't watched the entire movie, but I watched some of it, which means that I already got some of the pieces of the movie so far. But just because I haven't reached the end of the movie doesn't mean I haven't watched it, doesn't mean I haven't gotten some of it already. So it's the same thing when it comes to what's going on. Because a lot of, because uh, I'm not sure if you guys watched, but Dr. Richard Wolf actually talked about China, talking about how there's still state, so, still state socialism, state capitalism. And my thing would be, okay, they may still have some capitalist elements to it, but they're moving away from it. And the moving away from it is still part of socialism because socialism is just a transition to communism. So why are we still going to say, oh, well, they still have some capitalist elements still making them capitalist. So it's the same thing. It's like they're watering down capitalism in a way to move away from it into socialism. So that's what it feels like for me and i i hope i didn't say anything too too completely wrong in in the uh analysis of dialectics but that's what it looks like to me and so i, I and plus also uh, a, a chinese house is different from a chinese uh, different from an american house and a cuban house is different from a venezuelan or vietnamese house so therefore the way they clean their houses is going to be a little bit different than the way we clean our house so that's what it feels like to me. I love it. I, I love all of your analogies, JB. One of these days, you and I are going to get together and have an analogy podcast. 
where we'll just but to to go on that analogy um and don't get me wrong professor richard wolf is a brilliant guy but this isn't a dialectical materialist view of what socialism is it's and when you hear the sort of not real socialism argument especially from americans um it's as if they're sort of pointing at the fact that china is, has a broom in their hand right and they're cleaning the house but the american here is saying that hasn't even gone out and gotten a broom yet their house is like covered in dirt and mold and mildew and there's dirty clothes everywhere and they're like hey your house isn't clean like dude worry about your own house let china clean their house they seem to be doing a perfectly fine job they've raised living standards at a faster rate for more people than anything else in all of human history and so when we get to this sort of not real socialism view what they're doing by saying that's actually capitalism is telling people capitalism is awesome and progressive and makes people's lives better so we should all love capitalism <laughs> right it's just it's can i make an addendum though yeah yeah go ahead i i don't want to say that he is making it sound like there aren't doing actual socialism um i would recommend just watching the, the video first but at the same time, like when people call China state capitalist, is that an accurate, I don't want to get into the weeds on this, but is that an accurate descriptor of China or is it just they're doing socialism is just they're, they're phasing out capitalism. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 that's okay. It's a good question. Every single time I've heard the, that's not socialism, it's state capitalism kind of line. It's just been a word game about what they want to define things as. And as we've been learning in this class, it isn't from the idea out. It's from the material to the idea, right? That we don't define a thing by uh, characteristics we believe it should have. The real world instead creates the idea. And so the real world, in the real world, socialism is whatever it becomes as it's moving forward and progressing, right? Uh, all socialism really meant when Robert Owen first used it in English was a society that that is social in nature, right? That things uh, serve a ser social function rather than a liberal or individual one. And so when Marx and Engels come along and they create scientific socialism, the big, the, the big breakthrough is that it is the developing forces of production that create these social relations, right? So a socialism, a scientific socialism, must solve that contradiction between forces and relations of production by socializing the means of production. And that's a long, drawn-out process, right? He says in the manifesto that... Uh, What's hap what happens, what has to happen is that the working class, having seized state power, rests by degree all capital from the bourgeoisie. And so this is what China is doing, right? And along the way, it's creating this sort of pseudo-capitalist class because they don't function like a bourgeoisie. We need to make that clear. They are at all times subordinate to the Communist Party and the people. So there's that too. Um, but thank you so much for the question and the analogy, JB. You know I love those analogies. Uh, let's go on to the next question, which looks Yo, like- Do you want me to answer the question, though? Oh, yeah, yeah, or go ahead, Carlos. Why don't you take this one and the next one? Because I got to run in the hallway for a minute. Yeah, I, I wanted to address JB's question and just reiterate the same thing. Great. Uh, question and, and wonderful analogy and Wade says something very funny in the in the comments um, after uh, Noah said we don't even have a broom and he he said and we're hoarders uh, so <laughs> we haven't even thought about starting to clean we haven't even come to the realization that we have to do some cleaning um, I, I think you you make a very good point in distinguishing sort of the objective 
state structures and, and institutions and uh, their, their, their racist functioning and um, popular consciousness, right? Which is a, a good distinction between the objective and, and the subjective. Um, there isn't legalized racism anymore, uh, especially after the, the third American revolution, the, the civil rights movement. But the birthmarks of the racialized character of all of those institutions are still there. And they're producing outcomes such as the fact that it is black people who are disproportionately incarcerated, um, black people who are disproportionately killed by police, those sorts of outcomes. Um, so like at the formal level, there isn't racism at the functional level because there was and it's still around in the form of like birthmarks in the same way that socialism carries with it some of capitalism. Uh, the um, post civil rights uh, state institutions and civil institutions carry with it the lingering, the birthmarks of the previous um, uh, epochs. And there has been, as, as you mentioned, a big transformation in the people. I mean, the, the way that today, like racist outbursts are treated shows you two things. There's still racism, but the balance of forces have, has changed. So like, I just found out about uh, Kramer's outburst in 2006. I had no idea it existed. Um, for those that don't know, in 2006, uh, Michael Roberts, I think is his name. Um, he went on a horrifically racist rant at the Laugh Factory. Um, horrible. N-word with the hard R and just the most ridiculously racist rant. And it blew up. And of course, he got fired. And, and so every time something like that happens, it blows up now, precisely because it's not the norm anymore. Right. Whereas it, it wouldn't have blown up if we would have had smartphones in the 40s, uh, because it would have been part of the norm of everyday life. And that is uh, is something that we should look very favorable upon, the fact that things have changed and continue to change. I mean, I was at these protests during the Black Lives Matter movement, and there was a whole lot of white people there and non-Black people. And they all felt like by killing George Floyd, they killed one of us. It wasn't, oh, they killed the Black man. They killed one of us. They killed one of us. And it was not just in the US. It was protests that were around the world. And so that removal of the otherization that is essential for racism, I think it's in process. It's nowhere near done. But the balance of forces that changed has changed. And that should let us know that if the one of the central biggest factors that has prevented class unity in the US has been racist false consciousness and the color line, if that is, if the forces there are being tipped to a more anti-racist approach rather than racist, the potential that we have for revolution is greater than ever, greater than ever, because we don't have to deal with the stupidity of like white workers not wanting to work with black workers and overthrowing the existing order. That just is not something that we deal with anymore. So it's a, it's a very optimistic, and I think that uh, distinction that you make there is correct. And it's going to continue lingering. And that's part of the fact that uh, as the Mar Carlos Martinez quote that I, uh, that I mentioned, capitalism needs racism. It needs ways to divide um, the people and the concept of race itself is a product of, of capitalism. They needed to put down the joint rebellions that were taking place between the indentured white, uh, indentured slaves that were white and the um, um, African uh, slaves. Uh, and there was some cross pollination, some that were here, some that were there. Uh, but it needed to put that coming together of poor uh, black and white and indigenous people. It needed to put that down. And the way that it did that is uh, uh, divide and conquer. And racism was essential uh, for that. It develops with it uh, as a, the objective conditions make that sort of uh, ideological phenomenon absolutely necessary. Um, but uh, yes, thank you very much for, for the question, JB, and good to see you. Um, Ed, and then uh, Marxist Saul. Yeah, Carlos, uh, thanks for coming tonight and doing this. Um, I encountered a, a guy the other day on uh, Facebook 
And somebody had put a meme up about anti-capitalist statements or whatever. And this guy comes on and he says, um, uh, oh, uh, I agree with all those statements and I'm a capitalist. And I said, but, you know, do you own a company? And he was like, no. I said, you work for somebody, right? Yeah. And like, then you're not a capitalist. The capitalist is the person who is the owner class, you know, the, the bourgeoisie, bourgeoisie. And he said, well, capitalism is still the best system. And I said, but all these things that you don't like are happening. And he goes, no, that's because it's crony capitalism. And, you know, hell, I used to be a libertarian, so I know that phrase, but for once in my life, I was, I didn't know what to say. I mean, I did end up saying to another uh, person a couple days later, I said, uh, name one company that you would say is not engaged in crony capitalism. And, and she couldn't, she ran. I mean, she just shut down. But what would what would you do if you were discussing with somebody and they brought up the whole like oh there's a difference between capitalism and crony capitalism which i don't think there is but i understand because i was a libertarian oh jb yeah, do you want to take a stab at yes. that i see you're excited yes yes okay so potatoes right everybody likes potatoes right okay so if I say I'm allergic to potatoes, are you going to go and say, well, these are French fries? And, you know, you know, just be, it's like, well, I, I, can't, I can't take potatoes because because I'm allergic to potatoes. But those are those are these are those are French fries that you had. Try mashed potatoes. Try uh, potatoes uh, au gratin. Right. But the thing is, like, I'm still allergic to potatoes. You're not listening to me. Crony capitalism is still capitalism. Corporate capitalism is still capitalism. No matter what flavor you have of it, it's still capitalism. So you can't explain it away by saying, oh, well, this is just a different flavor of capitalism. It's still capitalism. Look, whether I have apple pie or apple crisp, it's still apples. That's the thing. And so, that, so when somebody says it's crony capitalism, I'm like, every capitalist, their goal is monopolization, to have everything under them in that particular industry. And this is why they buy up companies. This is why they will take as many of the workers away from these different companies so that they can ultimately have run the entire industry themselves. And so and anybody says, oh, it's just crony capitalism, not actual capitalism, or they'll say, well, we don't have capitalism, it's, cr it's cronyism. No, because how did they do it? Through the levers of capitalism. That's it. That's all. Sorry, I just had to put that in there. Thank you. No, that's, that's I so well said, brother. I think like this always reminds me of an Engels quote, right? And it was about anarchists of the time, and he said that, these gentlemen think that by changing the name of the thing, they th change the thing itself. And this is how these learned individuals mock the world, right? But that's just it. They're just changing the name. Um, I, what they really mean is monopoly capitalism, the stage we're at. And as JB just said, what led to that, right? What in the real world led to that? It's precisely what they want to go back to, which is impossible. And so really it's like, I, I do a few things in this situation. I'll say, I don't really care what you call it. I'm not criticizing that thing that only exists in your head. I'm criticizing the thing that exists in the real world. And if we're both criticizing that thing that exists in the real world, let's get together and figure out the real way to overcome it, right? Let's put aside all the dogmas, all the labels, all the reasons we're given to fight each other and figure it out. And when we do that, we begin to realize precisely what JB was just saying, that as Mark says, one capitalist always eats many, right? Um, and lastly, before I hand it back over to Carlos, um, you know what? I'll just do that now because I forgot what I was going to say. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, that uh, example of potato, I mean, what instantly came to mind was like the potential of a sketch like a key and peel sort of sketch where a guy gets to a restaurant and he says, I'm allergic to potato to the waiter. And he's like, okay, 
Um, and then he just brings him like potato chips or something and the person dies. And then he's like, but it was potato chips and not potato. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I so I think that uh, there's a comment that, that Pia made earlier, which I think it's really good, um, which is a sort of question, have we, can, can there even be capitalism without like the state, like a state capitalism, not just capitalism. And, and to be fair, there's a, a more technical way that like Lenin uses the term um, that is not even close to the way that people use the term state capitalism uh, today. But there, it is absolutely true that as at least since the bourgeois revolutions, um, and 1848 is usually a good marker for these. Some of them start earlier, some of them later. But you cannot have capitalism divorced from the state. Like, in fact, this, the stage of monopoly capitalism is often called state monopoly capitalism. It's always tied to the state. And it's because capitalism has gotten to a point where it's going to develop crises. Um, it's going to develop blockages and um, interruptions in, in the development of production. And um, it's going to develop a whole bunch of social ills. And the only way that it can mediate those such that it can change enough to stay the same and stay the course of, of capitalist development and accumulation is through the state, right? Um, the state is the one that allows for you know conquest, right? Uh, American capitalism cannot be divorced from the 800 bases that we have around the world, 800 military bases. Um, from the military capacities that we have to do all sorts of stuff, to send uh, uh, 100 billions in weapons to Ukraine. So you can't divorce it. You can't divorce American capitalism and its interests from the state. You also can't divorce like how in moments of crisis, instead of just like, and capitalism is no more and you have a, just a state of anarchy, what happens? The capitalist state comes to save capitalism. And so the, the state has always been there for for capitalism. So for someone to to talk about, no, it's not uh, capitalism, it's crony capitalism. And what they imply is that a variation of like it's state capitalism. Um, uh, what they're presupposing, just like the Western Marxist art, is a pure notion of capitalism. Uh, they can reject the capitalism in the real world, and they're still sustaining the pure notion of capitalism and some of them would say it like there's that famous clip of this uh somewhat chubbier uh young uh kid who asked Richard Wolf you know it's turned into a sort of meme he asked Richard Wolf in a, in a panel I think it was Fox News or something he says you know we've we've tried to see how far left we can get but what if we go the other way and go as far right as we can and have a pure capitalism no state you know just markets and uh, Wolf's response is correct. Like, it's a joke. Like, even, you know, ridiculous bourgeois economists realize that that, that doesn't exist. Like, a pure capitalism, this doesn't exist. Um, in the same way that, like, the pure socialism that the Western Marxists want today is impossible. Um, and I think that is a, a good rational kernel that we can use to show them why that's the case. And then... Um, why it is that the things that they don't like are part of capitalism, not any other thing that they add on it, any other qualification that they add on it. It's just, it's capitalism. And, um, you know, it, it also forces us to reflect on how it is that capitalism is always able to, at least in its American context, it's been able to ideologically get people to identify the things they don't like about their own system with an alternative system. And that you get that a lot from conservatives where they see these companies monopolizing, not giving a shit about workers. They see all of these things, big pharma. And what do they do? They call it communism. They see the state as being an instrument of the big monopolies. And they sit there and they call it, they say, you know, our, we have a basically a communist government now. But what the, so it's it's an interesting ideological operation that we have to try to make sense of. How has it been successful in a portion of society in convincing them that the ills that are created by capitalism are actually communist or non-capitalist ills, right? 
So that's a contradiction that we have to, to tarry with. But again, the method of rearticulation, take what they don't like or what they like and the rational kernel that you can connect to socialism, try to figure out a way to disconnect it from the things that they have connected it to and reconnect it to the thing that's actually right, which is socialism, working class power. Real quick, Carlos, I want to interrupt because we just got an interesting question in the YouTube that I had some thoughts on, but I want to hear your thoughts more than that since this is your lecture. Um, let's see here. Doug Jaffray says that he thinks telling Marxists in the U.S. to mind their business is a cop-out. It's like a condescending way to say Western Marxists are too stupid to recognize real revisionism and have a conversation about that. So I want to say a couple of things and I'll hand it over to you. One, every time I've heard someone call China revisionist, they've been the ones engaged in revisionism of Marxism. So there is like this dogmatic understanding of what revisionism is that comes down from the ultra left. That's one thing. The second thing is that if we have not produced a revolution in the real world, then there is something wrong with what we are doing. If they have, and they have done these amazing things that have blown out of the water everything else done in human history, then they are doing something correct. Marxism isn't this sort of dogma that you have to do X, Y, and Z. And to think that it is, is that revisionism, right? Instead, Marxism is a science, right, of historical development and human liberation. And what China is doing is liberating people, right? And freeing the forces of production and raising living standards and creating a world where we can continue this process. And so it's not that people are too stupid to recognize revisionism. It's that one, our theory here, because of a whole host of reasons we don't have to go into, has been stunted. And so a lot of the times we're just misreading Marxism. Even when we get it right or wrong, even when we get the words right, we're not really understanding what Marx was saying. And two, the proof is in the pudding, theory and practice, right? And Stalin explains this in Socialism or Anarchism, right? That the proof of good theory is in the building of socialism. And the building of socialism is proof of good theory. Uh, but go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. And usually what I end up finding is that the people that call other socialist states revisionists are the actual revisionists. Um, precisely because they treat Marxism as a set of conclusions and, and not as a worldview in a way of, a, of, of approaching the world. Um, of course you have to revise. Re revision, not revisionism. Revision is part of the central core of an outlook that sees everything in constant change and contradiction and that forces you to constantly revise the things that you're doing. I mean, look at the Lenin from State and Revolution and the Lenin from 1919 uh, or 1920. Um, in 21, you know, it's a it's a revised conclusions. Lenin is a revisionist then? No, of course not. Um, you realize that you do what you can with the world that you have. And that even the strongest socialist states, take China, they exist in a, in a world that's deeply antagonistic still to the construction of communism. They have to make concessions. The priority has to be sustaining the revolution, sustaining the working class in power through the Communist Party, improving the lives of their people, developing a more efficient state, developing you know, the sciences, the technologies, their military, uh, their de defense programs. Um, and that's it, that's like their main priorities now. Now they're developing, uh, since they've developed so much and bridged the gap between international um, inequality, they're working on common prosperity and bridging the gap between internal inequality that has developed within China. Lucerto has a really good paper that Eddie and I talked about uh, the other day on this. Um, but what I find is that the people that call other socialist countries, I mean, the, the only instance I think of, so, of genuine revisionism, which we could see in one of the five socialist states is Gorbachev's Soviet Union. And 
a little bit of the Maoist Cultural Revolution period in China that was engaging in what they call book worshiping instead of a genuine dialectical analysis. That doesn't mean that we reject that period. I think they did you know, certain amazing things and they set the conditions for the later period. But you have some of that dogmatism there that's uh, also found in, um, in, uh, in, in some of the people who today under the name of attacking revisionism hold themselves very revisionist positions in terms of substance because they're not willing to see how it is that in a new world, new policies and new approaches have to be taken. Why don't you go ahead and ask your question, Saul? We'll keep them going, you know, line them up and knock them down. I, I just wanted to say, you know, talking earlier, um, you know, talking about when, when, um, like, I, I guess Western lefts or say, I like, give a label to China and it's this big label, like it, it is capitalist, it is this or that, you know, there's, there's a concrete way to find out what exact how exactly china's society is how it operates and that's by going to the constitution of the prc and that's really all that we have in the united states to see what exactly is the law in china and i've had and i've pulled that out and particularly article 6 through 8 explaining you know how society what, what the socioeconomic discipline is in china and i've gotten the rebuttals i've gotten to this is well that's just the law that's like you know that's just that doesn't mean anything it's like, well, okay, well, let's go seize the means of production here in the U.S. right now because the law doesn't matter, right? We can go ahead and grab all, you know, property law doesn't matter. Or does it just not matter in China because you already had something in your head about China and, you know, and, and so the the whole, uh, there, there is a, like, you know, in there and includes the different types of economies, right? And it, it, But it, it's under a socialist state. It's under socialist law, which means that it, it's not like the gov, the, the, um, there's a property law that is that the the state has above everything and it allows a, say a capitalist market to operate within china but it's still not the law it's not like here where it is the ultimate o ownership over the means of production uh, it doesn't it doesn't decide the democratic process you know you can't lobby like but the real um i mean if you read article six through eight that's how the economy in china works and then what they're talking about is article 11 which is subject to Article Six in Art Article Six through Eight, as it says in Article Six through Eight, you know, um, and and the, that's that's kind of a more concrete way to find out, like, and that's what we're striving for. I mean, I guess the closest thing, you know, like North Korea, it's like Article Twenty, in Cuba, it's like Article Nineteen or Twenty, like it's it's the same, it's those, um, you know, the the various worker cooperatives owning the means of production or the state owning the means of production and the state belonging to the whole people that that's um the closest thing we have to that in the united states is articles probably um, or is it the 13th amendment it's not an article it's the 13th amendment that's the closest thing to a this kind of a property law coming down saying that slavery you can't own people you can't own actual you know unless the person has committed a crime then then slavery or you know, involuntary servitude. That's the closest thing we have to Article Six through Eight, and and that affects our society. You know, there's a big war fought over that, and it's you know, um, I, I don't know. That's something I always try to go to is what is the actual law? Because somebody even said, well, why do you need a law? The Constitution can't you just see with your eyes? I'm like, no, I, I live in the United States. How how do I? You know, I can't see China with my own eyes. Like, this is all we have. And if they're accusing somebody in China of breaking the law. Well, they can call like, you know, China, somebody in China and say, I think somebody's breaking the law. They're breaking, you know, they're breaking Article 6 through 8. And I'm sure they'll be really concerned, you know, that they're guessing that they're breaking the law over there. Yeah. And, you know, the uh, our uh, 13th Amendment is even written so as to exclude prisoners. And that's how they continue prison labor to that, this day. Right. So even ours isn't as good as the very bare minimum of Chinese, the Chinese constitution, right? Which gives so much more to the people. But thank you so much for that, Saul. That was really, really interesting, especially all the finer points of the constitutions. Um, yeah, was, yeah, I, I agree. And it's it's important not to minimize law um, because as good Marxists, we realize that uh, the judicature is a reflection of the economic base of society. Um, you cannot minimize it. And the fact that it's a reflection 
doesn't mean that we have to treat it as secondary, um, but we have to treat it as a, the sort of most coherent form through which the relations of society have been able to express themselves. Um, if you if you look at that, you you see it's it, it might not be the socialism in your head, the pure socialism, but it's definitely not like anything we can ever see in any other capitalist country. So I don't know what the hell you want to call it, like the uh, transition. I don't I don't know, but it's I I think you can't read it without coming away thinking it's just this it is a socialist society that's conscious about the fact that it's not perfect, it's still developing, and um, that uh, it's super self conscious. And another thing, just real quick. When people talk about China this and China that, China, I mean, if you can't substantiate your arguments with at least some form of appeal to the millions of theorists in China that are critically reflecting on China's position, I mean, get out of here. How, what? The, no one is more critical about Chinese socialism, Cuban socialism, Korean, than their own theorists. You know why? Because they realize that if shit's fucked up, we got to fix it because we want the revolution to survive and to thrive and to develop. So that's real criticism, imminent criticism that's actually grounded in a concrete understanding of their conditions and how the hell to overcome whatever contradictions arise and that are going to try to be uh, exacerbated by imperialism. So, yeah, we can critique China, but if if you're going to do it, I mean, appeal to some influential the trends in, in Chinese Marxist scholarship at the very least, show me that you've done the work and that you're not just, excuse the phrase, I'm sorry, that's kind of obscene, but talking out of your ass. Because that's what a lot of these people are doing. Um, it shouldn't be that way, but uh, a lot of Marxists get into this form of discourse as well when they talk about China, Cuba, whatever the case might be. Yeah, 100%. Um, Emily, go ahead. Hey, um, just kind of following up on what JB had said earlier about, um, you know, the perception that capitalism is a, you know, effective system. It's just certain certain problems like cronyism or greater corruption, and then kind of tying into what Sal was saying, um, and we've had other conversations about the Thirteenth Amendment and the legal structure in the U.S. and how it sort of serves the capitalist structure and how other places have come up with different systems. And one thing maybe that is um, important to think about in understanding Marxism is also, and, and in talking about it and talking to people with certain misconceptions is to also understand the capitalist structure. And I'm thinking about um, like corporations law, corporate law, business law. There's different kinds of business associations, but fundamentally corporate law is the, the legal structure. It's a, to go state by state, but it's effectively the same everywhere uh, in the US. And it's a board of directors that's you know elected by shareholders and the main uh, purpose is profit to the shareholders. And it's not individual people, you know, me with my little retirement or something, it's institutional investors, financial capitalists are the shareholders um, largely. And the entire purpose is profit to extract profit from, you know, collective work for a relatively small group of people. And that that's built into the system. That is essentially cronyism. And that is the law here. Yeah. Uh, capital, uh, the competitive era of capitalism led specifically to this monopoly era and these sort of financial institutions that make up the shareholders in all of these corporations. There's only a handful of them. I mean, there's charts you see passed around on the internet, right? That are just like, they show, and it's like, almost like, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's seen that old TV show, 30 Rock, right? It was a really funny show. It had Alec Baldwin and Tina Fey and, uh, uh, oh God, what's his name? Uh, I'm I'm spacing, but it doesn't matter. Um, but it it, it would it, it showed like this list of all these hundreds and thousands of companies owned. Uh, you know, it was like NBC and GE and all these huge companies owned by something called the Shinehart Wig Company. And that's like always how it is. There's some like weird 
like firm nobody's ever heard of. And then all these huge famous companies owned and under control of those financial institutions. Thank you so much for that, Emily, because that's really important, sister. That what, what you just said plays into the illusion of choice in a capitalist economy, because if you have, you know, four companies really effectively that produce all of the food and you know, personal products that we consume, we're really giving our money to the same people. But it, you know, it's presented to us like, you know, all of this choice exists. They did that. There's a trend on TikTok, and I don't know if you said it in the first part of your statement because I was replying to something in the chat. Um, but there's a trend on TikTok now where this guy goes to the grocery store and he goes to like the cereal aisle and he it does a video and then he shows you like all of these different different brands. They're all from the same. And so the cereal it looks like it has a million fucking different brands, but it's really like three. And then when you look at what three they are, they're the same three in every other. Uh, <laughs> part of the grocery store and they're the same three that like invest in uh in the military industrial complex and and in, in pharmaceutical medical pharmaceutical industrial complex and you start to realize oh shit you know it's uh it's really a handful of companies that uh, control everything and the plurality and the choice that we see is really a, a well-crafted illusion and it co-ops our participation in things like the military industrial complex because you're just going to get shampoo or buy a bag of oranges and you know you just get in racy on money effectively again you know if you didn't give enough with your taxes you know right and and the reply to that wouldn't be like some liberals do and i don't have a problem with this like going to local co-ops and and buying from farmers that's a positive thing i do it but uh a real reply would be like let's overthrow the order that forces us to do that not just like figure out individual ways of escaping not that those are necessarily wrong, but don't absolutize that into a solution so that it ends up being like just like a moralistic thing. Like, oh, you should be in charge of like finding ways to consume ethically. Co-ops and, you know, locally grown food and think can be part of the solution, right? Right. If we overthrow that order as it is, it's right. the people that recognize that first and that can afford that second. Because those things necessarily are a competitive disadvantage to the monopolists, and they're so low down that the monopolists don't even notice them. That's how they sneak by. As soon as they get big enough and enough of us begin shopping at them, right, uh, like a local grocery co-op, then the monopolists notice it cuts into where that what they're making, and they go and they take that. John Rockefeller was famous. He used to go to other companies, right? Walk into their accounting department without being asked, right? Just walk in, open up the Rockefeller company's books, like all these companies in that industry, open them up, put them on the table, the desk of the accountants and go, you guys can sell to us now or we can drive you under and buy the pieces. And that's how they operate. And so... Well, it's good to shop at these things and buying local is great. The only time it's a real solution is when we get together, organize and force the ruling class out. Uh, but I think anyway, let's that's a huge topic. We could stay on that forever. Uh, Jay, though, you had your hand up. Go ahead, brother. Hey, um, thank you so much, Carlos and uh, Noah uh, and uh been awesome today. Uh, so much to learn. Um, given our current situation, That's all Carlos, nothing to do with me. Well, yeah, Carlos, that was amazing, man. Um, but given our current situation, uh, in terms of you know both the um, labor strikes being the largest in history since you know, the steel strikes of the of the first of the Great War or whatever, and um, and since. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, right to work being ended in one in one state. We seem to have a lot of positive momentum, uh, the biggest um, um, movements in history and protest movements in history. But we also have, you know, Citizens United, corporate lobbyism, the Taft-Hartley Act that makes it impossible to strike for uh, political demand to actually change legislation. Although they can take our surplus labor value and use that, we cannot withhold it to do the same. Um, and so uh, given those circumstances, 
Uh, I was I was seeing a friend the other day um, uh, who's probably an anarchist uh, kind of uh, they were saying we need to you know strike on behalf of these things. I said, isn't that illegal? Don't we need to have some sort of movement that's like well, let me go let me say it like this. Um it, it wasn't and they said basically they can't arrest all of us. And I was like, well, yeah, no, I agree with you. Um, but what I'm saying is that don't we need a demonstration movement? And this is, I guess, my question. Uh, does this tactic sound reasonable at all? Having a movement that it has plausible deniability that's separate from the union. The union makes demands like $99 an hour that won't be met. The demonstration de makes demands for legislation. And until those legislative demands are met, the, um, the, 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 the union doesn't stop striking. Is that a reasonable tactical idea? Um, so I want to make clear we're on YouTube. We will never, ever, ever advocate anyone breaking any laws. Um, they're already after us. So we got to be very careful. Um, the uh, Everyone, everyone knows, or maybe not everyone knows, the Taft Hartley Act is one of the single greatest weapons the establishment has against us because it, it legalizes solidarity strikes, basically. And so you get into a really tricky territory where um, plausible deniability can be used against you legally. What they can't do, so here's the thing. And this is why the sort of anarchistic notion of voluntary, we all just sort of go out and strike needs organization behind it. Because if there's no unions organizing this, they can't target the unions, right? But revolutionary networks can be created, and there's a lot of other things that are possible that come from a political point of view rather than a labor point of view. And this puts us into different laws. Now, will they come after us for, for that? Of course, right? And they have in the past. And they've brutally suppressed communists. There's no one uh, short of the Black community and the Native Americans that they've repressed more than communists, right? Um, but yeah, I think your mind's in the right the 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 right area, Jay. Just keep thinking outside the box. Always be careful what you say in public, etc. Um, but I'd really like to hear uh, your thoughts on that, Carlos. Yeah, that's especially true in uh, in in certain states like Florida. You're starting to see. Um, stuff being said by governors don't come here if you're a socialist sort of thing and um, I didn't plan this but we moved out of my family moved out of Florida right like uh, as this started happening uh, to we're in Texas now so um, thankfully but um, yeah it's very scary because uh, I have a lot of good friends there and I know that in Miami things were uh, changing at a very very quick rate and the you know what was once a very reactionary place still has those elements, but the youth uh, has tremendous potential. Um, and, and, it, and it was very strange because there was almost no purity fetish. Um, there was people from DSA and all these wholly different organizations, people who call the US Turtle Island and people who are patriotic and everyone was coming together um, in big protests and to do stuff. And it was like a really good, example of like here's the shit that unites us let's focus on that regardless of whatever accidental differences we're divided by let's focus on the key stuff on the principal uh, contradictions to use miles term um so let's not disconnect it from the laws the anti-socialist law so the, the the point of like we have to be tactical in how we say things it's going to be more and more true um as as we keep progressing because times are changing and we're actually making a splash um our friends at rbn just got uh, their second strike on youtube um and it's i think one of the largest black communists i think it's the largest black communist channel and one of the largest communist channels in general on, on youtube uh extremely active channel debunking you know all the sort of same things that we uh, fight against here at the institute they just got their second strike, right? We've had seven fucking TikTok accounts banned. We can't grow substantially in the most important uh, and 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 broad platform 
in the U.S., right? So it's it's we're coming to a moment where censorship is the order of the day. As soon as you get big enough to be dangerous, you're going to be censored. Um, so we, we're going to have to start thinking more critically about how we phrase things. So that's a good point that you uh, made on, on Jay's comment, uh, Noah. But real quick, I would let me say interrupt that, you real quick, Carlos, because I, I, I want to hear this. But real quick, before that, I want to thank um, Dutch Jason for sending a bunch of people over and raiding. You're awesome, Dutch Jason. Thank you, Killmonger Born, for letting us know about this. Uh, we welcome you. So welcome. Go ahead, Carlos. Yes, thank you. Um, what I wanted to say is that you have a, you have a very weird situation uh, where, like, the leading unions, at least the largest one, the AFL-CIO, they just endorsed Biden, like, 15 months before the election, just deeply, deeply rooted in right opportunism um, and in a betrayal of the interests of the working class. We put out a really good article by Chris Townsend on it a few weeks ago, and uh, I think Eddie, um, Eddie and I covered it on stream. And the the Leninist response has always been: if there is a big union where the workers are already at, and the leaders are are functioning as labor aristocrats, oh, real quick, let the me interrupt. I'm sorry, Carlos. Before you get to the actual theory behind it, there was a big scandal over them endorsing Biden because it was done undemocratically too. And yeah. so this really ties into them being part of the remnant of the labor aristocracy. Right. Go ahead though. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew. They, they sweeped it under the rug. They made it difficult to find on the website. They didn't, there was virtually almost no information on the vote. Um, and Lenin tells us that when this is the case, when you have a massive union, with, I think, the AFL has more, easily more than a million workers, a few million workers. And the leaders are functioning as labor aristocrats, right opportunists, sellouts of the working class for the crumbs that the ruling class gives them. The response shouldn't be, let's not go to that union. Let's form our own thing. It can be, like you can have an uh, Amazon labor union and if it works, you know, congrats. But the Leninist response usually has been, go to that union and show the workers how the union bosses and the union leaders are selling out and try to take power in that union that's already ruptured, right? Because unions are, for, for lack of a better word, as Lenin would say, you know, schools of communists. There are certain forms of democratic working class organizations that are progressive, the, the most progressive sort of organization, along with co-ops that you can have within a capitalist system. Um, so if the workers are already there, Go to that union, tell them how the, the, the leaders are sellouts. And I think um, we have a growing sentiment in the country, both within and dem within Republican and Democratic uh, working class voters, but uh, within the independents that makes up the largest bloc, a very anti-establishment sentiment. And it's very abstract at the level that it is. Um, and it's a, a very spontaneous and immediate reaction to like the status quo. Um, but it's a very positive phenomenon that as communists, you know, for lack of a better word, we can exploit. Like it's a very good for us. Like we can go there and and show them like this is good. This is why um, this is the case. And this is how we can uh, change it. This is what we have to do. Um, that makes our moment very right. And um, whether the forms that like a struggle for political power will take whether those are mass wildcat strikes or whatever they might, we can't, we can't know. And I, I, in part because the organization isn't even there. Like we don't have a strong communist party. Um, we don't have many organizations that are uh, committed to uh, the working class in a way that can actually substantially influence politics. We're seeing the beginnings of that here with the Cornell West campaign. Hopefully that uh, opens up a space for a large scale politics that's beyond the uh, two fascistic party duopoly. Um, and we'll see, but you know, we can't predict the forms that the struggle will take. It might could take wildcat strikes if like union bosses don't make way for 
uh, more rank and file leadership. Sean O'Brien is a positive phenomenon and, and Team Sears is a fairly militant, was a fairly militant uh, rank and file who got elected. Um, who, his challenger was the third like labor aristocratic um, candidate. who was the guy that uh, the son of Hoffa um, preferred. So we have some interesting development, developments there, but it's too early to say um, what forms that uh, could take. I also think it's a time of new types of organizations, right? Labor unions are gigantic when they can uh, be affected. Like, look at the Teamsters and how they are acting with UPS. It's exactly what you want to see in organized labor but that's not all we have right it's not just the proletariat anymore and we'll learn about this organization brings with it and is a product of new technology and new forms of production itself right um tech is huge this is a big deal Tech is everything. Tech changes more, or just as not much, if not more, than the steam engine did, the spinning jenny, and all these things that Marx's his own self tells us are the basis of capitalism, the sort of material that it all comes out of, right? And we have this new thing now. We have tech, we have AI, we have the internet, we have full financialization, and we have the product of that, the social relation that we call reproletarianization, this new class of people that are brought down to the level of the original industrial proletariat, and that they cannot accumulate any stability. We are forced to sell labor power for sustenance, and that was the direct effect of proletarianization. And it happened to all the formerly stable middle classes, just as we learned from Engels in Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific, right? Uh, but yeah, what what are your thoughts on, on that sort of thing, Carlos? Like new forms of organization. Uh, quickly, though, because I know we still have questions to get to. Well, I think it makes the, the concept of reproletarianization, and we were talking about this earlier today, just all the more important to have. Um, without, you know, you, you can't fully understand like uh, even the uh, like how the purity fe fetish functions, how like middle class consciousness appears in various parts of the working class without understanding this phenomenon of free proletarianization, um, which is so essential and uh, it's it's genuinely a breakthrough in like a political. Um, economic understanding of, of the country and how class relations have changed. And, you know, um, as we've been saying from the start, Marxism is about looking at how these things develop and how there's contradictions involved and various interconnections that change. And, um, and I think the concept of reproletarianization, uh, it's conjunction with an understanding of the role of AI and tech and all of these different things. Um, introduces new problems that if we are not addressing because we're stuck in the same old categories, we're not only not gonna understand it, but we're gonna be even farther away from being able to, to, to fight it. Because in order to fight something, we have to kind of have an idea what the hell we're fighting um, and how it, it would be best to fight it. Um, so, you know, for example, like just a, a quick one, one of the assumptions was, and you guys know this, capitalism, socializes production. People are already producing together, but privatized accumulation continues. There are many industries today, even very key industries in the US, where production isn't even socialized anymore. They have re-atomized production, right? The gig economy, huge. You can't just go to a factory of gig workers and get them organized, right? They have uh, made them sort of um, like Leibniz's monads. They're like completely disconnected from all the other workers. And 
And this presents new questions for us. Like in those industries, how do we reconnect uh, something that before was already connected and much and made our task much easier, right? So these are all new questions that we have to be open to asking that are gonna force new ways of, new conclusions and new ways of thinking. And I think reproletarianization is like the first attempt that I've seen at trying to tackle this change. So I'm very excited that we have this sort of security fetish and, and reproletarianization. Um, and tomorrow's class, uh, next week's class, excuse me, is gonna be so important. Thank you, brother. Uh, all right, we're we're closing in on two and a half hours, just so you all know. Uh, but go ahead, Wade. You had you had something to add or ask? Uh, yes. So I I did want to um, and stop me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, strategy um, is probably shouldn't be discussed uh, publicly. Right? <laughs> um, so like in these classes we're here to learn um how to think and and uh how to identify um the specific um causes um the relationship and you know the progression of uh our socioeconomic situation um what i would say is if anyone does want to discuss strategy, you should probably do it within the context of a party uh, with full operational security and a party that practices uh, democratic centralism. So, yeah. 1,000, 1,000%, brother. And um, we're going to be doing a sort of fundraiser event here pretty soon. Uh, we're in the base level of organizing it now. And there's going to be a lot of sort of organizational workshops there then, right? So how to go about doing things uh, with labor and political organizing can be addressed there. So uh, I know everybody's excited to get to work, right? And I, I, I love where all of Jay's questions come from because that's where they are. He wants to get things done. And I love that. But yeah, this is YouTube and this isn't the party. We're, you know, we're members of the party here, but not the party. That's something, uh, and believe me, in our age of surveillance, there is a lot they can do. Your club can teach you about OPSEC if they're worried about stuff. Uh, go ahead, Saw. You had something to add. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, I wanted to mention a particular you know, for organizing and just basic principles, and it's kind of like an art of war for communist struggle, is left-wing communism and infantile disorder by V.I. Lenin. And, and you know, history repeats itself. And it's oftentimes like reading Lenin, you, you hear him going at the purity fetish of the German lefts and the Western lefts, almost the entire thing. But they're like, no, we got to pull out of the trade unions. Uh, we can't send our parties into uh, bourgeois parliaments, you know, this and that, like, you know, uh, petty bourgeois revolutionism. Um, and, and one of the most important chapters of that book is an essential condition of the Bolshevik success because it gives a very general uh, outline of, you know, I guess he says the conditions that made it to where the Bolsheviks could maintain state power for uh, two months, much less two years, you know. And, uh, but there's a particular chapter where he's particularly going in on what is like the, uh, the you know, purity fetish at the turn of the 20th century called um, uh, should revolutionaries work within the reactionary trade unions? And that was one of the things that, um, you know, kind of, that was one of the readings I first read that like really broke me out of the idea that you don't have to stand near people who ideologically agree with you all the time. Like it's not, uh, that's not like having this good thoughts and stuff. It, it's, it's like, it's like a religion. Like you, when you think you're going to be in the afterlife with everyone who agrees with you, not religion, I'm sorry, but it's kind of like American Christianity. I'll, I'll say that like the, you know, that everyone has to agree with you and, and then you will be in heaven later. And it's like, there's not a material objective we're trying to complete, you know? Um, but I, as far as I think just gaining principles, it's almost like an art of war on, on organizing left-wing communism and infantile disorders of, a very important book to read if anybody wants to go read that book. <laughs> 1,000, 1,000, 1 million percent. That is one of the best books of all time. And do not believe anyone who's telling you that means we should just go root for the Democratic Party, right? 
Uh, actually read that and see what Lennon says about those things. Uh, what are what are your thoughts on that, Carlos? Uh, yeah, I was just looking uh, for the walk the walk article because mm. someone mentioned that. I'm just gonna send it in the chat. But it's it's one of the most important books that we can read now. Um, I uh, I saw the task that I was embarking on in the purity fetish, kind of in that tradition, and I cited um, quite a bit. And also the essay that he does in nineteen. A little bit before that, I want to say 1916. Um, I'm, I'm, no, uh, 1918. He said he has an essay in 1980 where it's like um, left communist childishness or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, both of those, it's a precursor to left wing communism, uh, but they're amazing. I mean, what he's criticizing there is the purity fetish. Um, there wasn't the term, but uh, the, the concept, like, what he was describing in different words was the purity fetish. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I couldn't recommend it more. Uh, yeah. So speaking of my, my very, very short essay, walk the walk, how to conduct ourselves as communists. Uh, and speaking of reproletarianization, I've expanded that walk the walk essay to be almost uh, uh, a, 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 half a pamphlet of its own now. It's a, I, I've expanded this and it's going to be included in a book project in which reproletarianization is the central theme. But walk, walk the Walk, How to Conduct Ourselves as Communists is basic things that uh, are really how we need to conduct ourselves as communists in the USA of the 2000s in order to not just sort of be correct ideologically, but become the sort of people that people will listen to and even try to see if we're ideologically correct, right? So, uh, for example, let me just read you um, one of the things here. I have a sort of list or a list here, right? And it says a communist leads by example. It is not necessary for a communist to brag or tell everyone how wonderful he is. This is low trite and beneath the communist souping to such petty bourgeois self-aggrandizement is anathema for anyone seeking to lead the proletariat a communist is the most diligent and dedicated of studiers and seeks knowledge in order to help liberate the working masses she does not treat education as a way to feel superior to others or simply memorize conclusions in order to sound smart and show off for her peers she ponders these conclusions deeply and instead begins to understand the process of arriving at them and helps her brothers and sisters of the working classes learn more, bringing them up and not putting them down. And that is what we're sort of trying to do here in this class, right? We're beginning to understand the process of arriving at our own conclusions. We don't need to memorize, you know, what Lenin thought about a certain thing happening in 1990, right? We can use the same processes that Lenin used to analyze that situation in our situation and come to our own conclusions. And this, this understanding of the universal in particular is a central part of all Marxism, but something that we lost in the US. So it is of particular importance to us as American Marxism takes shape. But all that said, I think we're, we're going to call it a night there. It's been a fantastic, fantastic night. Thank you to everyone in the class. Stick around and we'll hang out for a minute after we go off the air. Uh, thank you so much to our guest teacher, Carlos Garrido, who is, you know, one of the best friends I've ever had, but also one of the most brilliant Marxist minds I've ever had the pleasure of working with, editing, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's going to, you know, say, no, oh, no, anyone but me. But this guy is still young and he's producing some of the most breakthrough theory the U.S. has ever seen. Well, not ever, like since the day, the early days, there hasn't been any new theory here. And this is new theory, and it applies here. And all of the leading Marxist thinkers that we know of 
are saying things like the purity fetish is necessary for anyone interested in building socialism in the U.S. And so I think it's good to take them seriously, right? Uh, so yeah, thank you, everyone. Remember, next week, we're going over reproletarianization. We'll be uh, same time, 5 p.m. Eastern. And I'm really excited about that one. It's going to continue this kind of thing, like applying what we've learned in all the previous classes. Remember, if you're working on a paper, keep plugging away. It's not due next week, but the week after. And I do have one more thing to say. Uh, tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern, uh, yours truly is going to be having a discussion with anti-communist, uh, I don't know what he'd like to call himself, but Drew Pavlov, right, who's an Australian, and uh, he... He says a lot of wild stuff, and I'm hoping I can try to understand where he gets it from because I, I can't find the source of any of it. Uh, so, yeah, thank you, everyone who rated all of the people watching anyway. Thank you, class. Thank you, Carlos. And we're going to play out with the international as we always do. See everybody next time. <laughs>